you grew up in a Mormon family in Utah. I wonder what that was like for you. I mean, for me, it was all I knew at the time. But now that I've seen some different experiences, I grew up in a very religious, very family-oriented community and grew up in a family that was kind of moving from the lower to the middle class for the first time. So my mom grew up in a family of nine kids. I mean, she still talks about to this day, like what it was like when she bought the first pair of jeans and how guilty she felt buying clothes instead of sewing her own. There wasn't a lot of money, but we didn't know any different. That's just what life was. Was education a very big feature in your life then? Yeah. So both of my dad's parents were teachers. One was a high school teacher. One was an elementary school teacher. My grandma was actually a first generation college graduate. So my grandma was the breadwinner, which is a little more conventional now, but in Utah at that time was very unconventional. So she raised nine kids and had a master's degree and worked full time. And like her work ethic was out of control. And also both my parents, you know, went to college and well, they got married while they were in college. And we were taught that the most important thing in life is going to college and getting a degree, and getting good grades. And now we have a family with a few dropouts, which was a little bit interesting. And I can talk later about what it was like when I dropped out of college because I was the first in my family to drop out of college. And it was a controversy for sure. <laughs> Education, funnily enough, was much more important for my parents than it was for me. And partially because I had, frankly, a pretty miserable experience in school. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't feel like I was getting nearly as much out of it. And relevant to that story is my dad was an accountant, still is an accountant. So we were among the first people to have a PC at home. That was a big, big deal. And I fell in love with the computer instantly. And I didn't grow up with many kids around me. So we grew up in a trailer park in Utah. It's the cheapest housing you can get. So all of the kids were either at daycare all day or at school all day because all the parents, you know, worked or were gone. So there wasn't much of a friend group to hang out with. There weren't kids my age to play with. So it was being in the backyard or being on the computer. And so I fell in love with the computer. So I got the internet as a birthday present when I turned eight. And back then it was dial up and you had to have a separate modem and it was super slow, but that was my window into the rest of the world. Growing up, we had books, everybody has books, but there was so much that I didn't have access to in a small town that the internet opened up for me. So I much preferred the internet to going to school (laughs) is the short answer. And that caused a lot of consternation at home. Do you feel like the world opened up further when you learned HTML at the age of 11? How did that happen? Yeah, I was originally just a consumer of the internet and the internet then was very different. It was a lot of academia, a lot of blogs, companies were just starting to come online. So maybe a couple magazines or newspapers here or there, but it was really more about bulletin boards and blogs and, and stuff like that. So my grandma was a technical writer at a company called Novell, which was one of the earliest tech companies. So she, to this day, is very tech savvy, which you wouldn't expect if somebody her age, she saw that somebody at Novell and Novell was one of the earlier operating systems. So they built an operating system for companies and schools and was by far the biggest tech company in Utah. And a lot of what exists in tech now in Utah came from Novell. And my grandma didn't join because of the tech. She was a writer and just happened to work there. But she saw on the bulletin board, one of her colleagues was going to teach a free class on HTML and CSS. And that's really all the internet was at the time was a bunch of HTML pages. And so I went to that class and I need to find that guy and figure out who he is. And it was like, it was heaven. It was a bunch of nerdy kids like me. I mean, I... I didn't know anybody else who cared about computers. Like it was still a very nerdy thing at the time. And kids my age just wanted to play sports and video games and not play with computers. So it was instantly there was like, it was my tribe of people. I thought they were all pretty smart. I was a bunch of 11 and 12 year old kids. And we ran our first HTML, which was super, super simple and not sexy. But you're actually doing something in the computer that you did. And the guy bought us pizza and it was free. And I just couldn't believe that this world existed. And that kind of set me off into a path where 
not only can you consume with the internet, you can be a creator. And also importantly for me, there weren't very many kids my age around. So I always was hanging out with adults. Like even when I was super young, I would just wander around the neighborhood and talk with all the adults. So I always felt even at a very young age, more comfortable around adults than people my age. And on the internet, you can be an adult and people will treat you like an adult. And if your English is proper enough, and later on, if your marketing copy is good enough, nobody knows the difference and you can just start living like an adult. And that was actually really important for me at the time. I wanted to escape childhood and start being able to be an adult, which is probably not what everybody wants at that age, but that was really valuable for me and important for me. So were you thinking at the time, I want to enter into tech? I didn't know that tech was a thing then. I knew about people who started their own business and I knew about entrepreneurship and I knew I wanted to do that. And I love tech, but honestly, it wasn't until I basically dropped out of college and it's much later on, but I knew I loved international stuff and I was living in China and I thought that was just really interesting. I just moved to China to see what it was like. And when I was there, I realized I like the idea of international stuff, but I, I thought for a while I wanted to be an importer exporter because that's what I had done to sell stuff online at home. I'd buy stuff from China and sell it on eBay. That's when I was like, actually these things, these two things that I love, like entrepreneurship and tech, they actually work really well together, but there wasn't like a tech startup scene. There are a few tech startups, but it wasn't an obvious career path the way it is now. It wasn't obvious to me that those two worlds would intersect in the way that they, they do today for me. So before China, you actually went on a moral mission to Danes in eastern Ukraine. You can speak fluent Russian now after two years there. What was the whole experience like? Because I looked up Danes and it's an industrial city. It's got landmines, armed conflicts. Foreigners are generally prohibited from entering. It doesn't sound like a very peaceful existence there. No, it was, it was not. Yeah, a lot of people in Donetsk could not fathom the idea that an American was in Donetsk. So they would assume either you work in mining somehow because it was a very mining centric culture or that you were a spy, <laughs> which shows you kind of the former Soviet Union was still very real in Donetsk. And now this didn't happen after I left, but now there's the Russian Ukrainian conflict happening there. And a lot of the people that I know have either now left or few have died, but it's an even less hospitable environment today than it was when I left. So a couple of years after conflicts broke out and depending on who you trust or who you're listening to, either a pro-Russian group decided to separate from Ukraine or Russia invaded Eastern Ukraine, depending on which side you listen to. A lot of the places that I lived are now destroyed and a lot of the people have either left or it's, I mean, it, it's the war zone to this day, less so than it was five years ago, but it was a very interesting place for an American who had never left Utah and had never seen a drunk person to be dropped into. Uh, very, very different culture. The other thing that was meaningful for me there is I grew up Whenever I went to school, whenever I did anything, what everybody said about me was that I was very talented and very smart, but had zero work ethic. So it was always all this wasted potential. I skipped more than half of my classes in school, but I still ended up with good grades and being an honor student and high enough percentile in all the tests that I could still get into good colleges, but I never attended class, which is technically illegal. So there are some problems with doing that. But Ukraine is where I learned two really important things. I learned to work incredibly hard, regardless of what was happening externally to me. The life of a missionary is you get up at 6.30 a.m., you work out, you eat breakfast, and then by, I think it's 9 a.m., or no, it's 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., you're studying. So you spend an hour studying on your own, you spend an hour studying with a companion, which is the person you live with. And then you spend an hour studying Russian, the language. And then you're out the door at 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. with an hour break for lunch. And all day you are either doing service, you're teaching English, you're knocking on doors, you're going into people's homes. I still know parts of Eastern Ukraine better than the people that live there. I know every single street. I know every single house. I know to some extent who lives in most of the houses. And you spend all day walking around, working, 
whether it's summer and it's 40 degrees Celsius, which is something like 100 Fahrenheit, or whether it's negative 40, which is negative 40 Fahrenheit, you just don't stop no matter what. And that was a really important lesson for me. And the other important lesson that I learned was that it is okay to be different than everybody around you. And growing up in Utah, everybody is more or less the same. And if you're different in any way, you're ostracized. Even the most rebellious people will feel a lot of pull to fit into the culture. And in Ukraine, that wasn't an option. There was no way I could feel like a U Ukrainian. I was a missionary, which is weird. And after many years of communism and government enforced atheism, to be a religious preacher on the street is to be a crazy person. And so you come to terms with the fact that everybody around you thinks you're crazy and becoming okay with that, where you are comfortable thinking differently than everybody around you. You're comfortable seeing the world differently than everybody around you was as important, I think, as learning to work really hard. Because until then, I would decide whether what I was doing was a good idea, slightly based off of what everybody else would think about it. I think that was one of my greatest weaknesses growing up. And if you can learn to truly think for yourself and truly think individually as an entrepreneur, that can be one of your greatest strengths. When I invest in companies now, that's one of the things that I look for is how much are you influenced by what is normal? And I, I don't know that I would have had the courage to drop out of college or to move to China or to do a lot of the stuff that I did had I not had that missionary experience in Ukraine, I probably would have just felt like this is what you do. You go to college and then you get a job and maybe you start a business on the side, but it, I wouldn't have felt as confident in forging my own path, I guess. And when you still in the Ukraine, when you started Stoptopia, because you were an eBay junkie? No, that was actually before. So another aspect of my growing up is that you paid for everything yourself from the time you turn like 12. And that's part of how my parents grew up as well, is your parents provide food, they provide shelter, they'll make sure that you don't die. But if you want the clothes that you think are cool, you have to earn the money to buy them yourself. If you want to, it's not a big thing, but I played soccer and the club soccer fees were $200 a year. It's not very much, but for a 12 year old, that's a lot. If you want to play soccer, you can do that, but you have to earn those fees on your own. My parents would give you a low hourly wage to work in the garden or to do stuff around the house. I think they wanted to instill in us a work ethic of, we'll pay for things as a family, but you have to be contributing to the family. And the easiest way to measure that is just, we'll pay you and you can do whatever you want with it. But pretty quickly learned that making $5 an hour to weed the garden for mom is not the most efficient way to earn money. So me and my brothers and my sisters as well, we were all starting little businesses, whether it was a lemonade stand or shoveling snow or selling stuff. And so when eBay came around, I was one of the earliest eBay buyers and sellers. That was the thing for me. I could make money that way. I could buy stuff that I wanted cheaper. eBay was like the Amazon of today, but much more chaotic. You could buy everything on there for less than retail. If you knew how to search really well, you could get discounts. And I made a ton of money as a kid being able to find stuff that nobody else could find because of eBay is weird the way that eBay listed things and buying it and turning around and selling it with good marketing behind it. And that's how you know, I made thousands and thousands of dollars in my teens doing that. And there's no way I could have made anywhere near that kind of money working a job or working for my parents or whatever else. I think that turned me and all of my siblings onto a path of entrepreneurship in a way that I'm actually hoping to replicate for my kids. And as a kid, you can only earn like $7 an hour if you want to go get a job. So you can either spend all of your nights and weekends working a job for $7 an hour, or you can learn to use eBay. And you know, I was probably making a couple hundred dollars an hour, and then you can hang out with your friends and have everything you want. So it was uh, a lesson in what different paths in life look like. So my family went on a trip to New York City. None of us had ever been to New York. It was very, very exciting. My parents never really went on vacations unless it was camping. So this is a big deal for the family. 
And we wanted to go see a Broadway play because my family's also very musical. Everybody plays several musical instruments. Everybody sings, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. My mom had heard about a Broadway play called Wicked, which was brand new at the time. And so we started looking for Wicked tickets a year in advance. And I said, well, let's look on eBay. I buy everything on eBay. It turns out if you look on eBay for tickets, you see the tickets that are for this weekend. And it was sold out months in advance. And if you didn't have a ticket, you know, you had to pay more. And another feature of eBay at the time was you could see all of the completed auctions. You had a complete history of what everything had sold for going back as long as you wanted, which you can't really see that today. You don't know how many items sell on Amazon other than trying to look at reviews. Uh, and I guess eBay is still around. So, so there's that. Realized that tickets were not at a discount. They're actually much more expensive. And so looking at the completed auctions, trying to figure out why that was, my brother and I noticed a pattern of a select set of tickets for if you get this night and these seats, those tickets will sell for three or four X the retail price. So for the, the mission I served in Eastern Ukraine, another aspect of Mormonism is you pay for that yourself, your entire, it's only, it's like 10 or $11,000 that you save up by the time you're 19. So when we were earning money, 50% automatically went to the mission fund and then you could spend the other half. So me and my older brother both had pretty significant mission funds at the time. And without telling our parents, we bought like $5,000 worth of tickets. So we spent our entire life savings on these tickets. We turned around a few months later, we sold them all and we doubled our money and we put the money back in the savings fund. And then we told my accountant of a father that we had just gambled our life savings on what we were convinced was a really good business idea. And he was livid, but we now had capital to play with in a way that we didn't have. So I was doing that on the side, but my brother had done that with his money and I didn't have enough money to do that at any reasonable scale without taking out my mission fund and my dad wouldn't let me. So I downloaded like this business plan template and I had written like a 35 page business plan on exactly what I would do, you know, if I wanted to scale up buying and selling tickets in the right way. And then my uncle, who was an entrepreneur and had sold a couple of companies, had bought another company that was selling office furniture online. So after I graduated from high school so that I could finish saving up for the mission, I was working for him and the, the furniture store was going okay. But over lunch, I was talking to him about, he'd heard about some of the ideas that I'd had in buying and selling tickets and he was interested in it. And I brought in, you know, my 35 page business plan and showed it to him and he, he read it through over lunch and basically said, like, we should do this. I can provide the capital. I can do whatever you want, but this is super interesting. And this is really well thought out. So in a way he was the first investor, but he said, I want to pull you off of the stuff that you're doing now and have you do this, which to me was a dream. And he said, you have two options. I can give you half of the company and we can do it 50, 50 and I'll provide all the capital and you run the thing. Cause he was quasi retired and didn't want to work. Or you can just run it and I'll take all the risk and I'll pay you $14 an hour. And I said, $14 an hour sounds incredible. So I took the, the salary instead of the equity. And part of that is because I wanted to pay for my mission, which was a few months away. But yeah, by the time I left for my mission, we were buying and selling millions of dollars of tickets. And eventually that company became worth millions of dollars and I made $14 an hour. So. It was a really good learning experience for me. I mean, there are a few flaws in my thinking that I discovered between the business plan and the actual execution of it. I learned where I'm strong and where I'm weak from a business management standpoint. And I learned the value of equity <laughs> and the value of taking risk as meaningful in building wealth. But yeah, so that was a phenomenal learning experience for a 17, 18 year old kid. What do you think was your secret sauce? I imagine people must have noticed suddenly you were not earning seven dollars, you were earning thousands and they would want to replicate it. So how did you stay ahead of everyone else? And that was a problem that I always had when I was buying and selling stuff on eBay. It would be like, well, I can buy this soccer ball for $10 and I can sell it for $30. Like, why is that still an option? And I puzzled over that for a long time. Why had no, nobody else figured that out? Why had the market not corrected? And then when I was older and was making real money, I realized, 
oh, because it's actually not worth anybody's time to spend half an hour buying and selling a soccer ball to make $5. So I think there's an element of it where there's the old efficient market hypothesis economist joke that if an economist sees a $20 bill on the ground, they'll say, oh, that's not real because somebody would have picked it up. Sometimes it's real. And sometimes your incentives are different than other people's incentives. I think one of the traps that people can fall into is the assumption that if a business idea is a good one, it's already done. I've now found that that's just nowhere close to true. There are millions of businesses that could be started and grow really big and be really profitable that people haven't started. Sometimes it's because they don't have the time. Sometimes it's because they don't have the resources. Oftentimes it's because they don't even realize that that opportunity is there or are willing to do what it takes to make that opportunity real. I think in the ticketing instance, there are a few people that learned that it was real, but that industry was so big that everybody could carve their own niche. And we would talk to other people that are doing way more than us in volume. And they're like, yeah, but I'm really good at Oakland Raiders tickets. And that's my thing. And I understand that really well. And a lot of the people that got into buying and selling tickets, it was a more gruff crowd and they were very into sports oftentimes. So the Broadway crowd was very small. People weren't thinking that way for the more artistic types of tickets. So actually one of the people that I've seen that made some of the most money in buying and selling tickets was buying and selling opera tickets. But nobody even knows that opera tickets have that kind of a marketplace. So, you know, if you go to a sporting event, you see people on the street buying and selling tickets that that's there. But opera, so, you know, they had an arbitrage that I didn't even realize at the time. You went to your mission trip, you came back. What was the thinking behind going to college? Yeah, that was always the plan. And that's just what you did. My grandma was a first generation college grad. Both of my grandmas on each side were first generation college graduates. They both went to the same college. My parents went to the same college and it was like, it's actually pretty hard to get into. It was an honor to be able to do that for all of them. And so that was the expected path. Growing up, it was always, oh, I hope that if you're really, really smart, you can get into BYU one day. And if you worked really hard, like that was the goal. And I got in. And so, yeah, it's just the expected path. As you alluded earlier, your family, the last thing they're going to expect is for you to drop out. So that would have been pretty difficult. Yeah. Short answer is I was miserable. <laughs> I didn't enjoy the classes. I didn't enjoy the environment. I mean, at that point, I had just been kind of off on my own, learning on my own in Eastern Ukraine. I had started companies and then I went back to what felt like a very rigid, very expensive, very uninteresting place, frankly. And you know, maybe before I went to Ukraine, it would have felt more interesting. And the social life did nothing for me. I didn't care to go to parties. I could have my own set of friends if I wanted to outside of that. So I didn't feel a need for that. I was really bored one semester and I just felt trapped. One of the things that I enjoyed the most about Eastern Ukraine is that everything was a challenge. Even getting to the grocery store, taking all the buses, learning what to buy and then buying it and then getting home, whether it's you're talking to a taxi driver and like bartering with him to take you home cheaper or figuring out what the bus schedule was or what the tram by schedule was. Like everything was a challenge and I loved that. And then I got home and the college that I went to was 20 minutes from home. I had grown up going to the sporting events there. So I kind of already knew the campus, the classes were boring and uninteresting. I didn't feel challenged or excited at all. Every weekend I would get in my little car and I would just drive somewhere because I needed to get out. I needed to escape. Like the beach in California was like 12 hours away of driving, but every weekend I would just get out of class at 3 PM. I'd drive through to California through the night. I'd sleep in my car for a couple of nights and I'd drive through the night back. And that was like the only way that I could feel like I was doing something interesting or exciting. And then I was sitting there with one of my roommates who is also uh, one of my mission buddies. We went, went to the same school and we had an experience on the mission where we kind of said something along the lines of what's the one thing in your life right now that basically you're just not brave enough to do. And like, think about it instantly. And on the mission, it was like, I hate talking to people on public transport because it's kind of weird to do that in former Soviet states. A lot of people are quiet. You don't talk to people you don't know generally, but as missionaries, you're supposed to be talking to everybody all the time. So we said, all right, we're going to spend all day doing nothing other than taking public transport. 
and talking to people on every trip that we take, which was hell, honestly. But like going through that, you kind of learn that you can do the thing that scares you and that you don't want to do. And that's a really rewarding experience. So we're, you know, in our dorm at college, kind of having the same discussion where like he, he was watching me be completely miserable in school. And I would talk with him all the time about how much, you know, I wanted to go do something different. And I think he kind of recognized that the only thing holding me back from doing that was like my lack of courage, frankly. And so he said, all right, same thing we did on the mission, respond instantly. What's the thing that you want to do, but you don't even dare let yourself think about? I was like, I want to move to China. And that shocked him. This was 2009, 2010, like China was just starting to become the China that it is today in some ways. And so everybody was really interested in it, but most people didn't really understand what was happening. And I'd read a bunch about it and he's like, well, how much money is in your bank account? And it was like a thousand dollars. How much does a one-way ticket to Shanghai cost? Well, first we Googled all of the cities in China and decided which looked the best based on Google images. So that took about 10 minutes. But then he's like, yeah, just like buy a one-way ticket to China and see what happens. I was like, what? That's what I'm going to do. So I did that. After I bought the ticket, I realized you have to figure out visa stuff. So that was a tight turnaround. And then I called my parents and said, hey, I'm dropping out of college and I'm moving to China. And at that point, my mom was just like, whatever, Austin, I know I can't convince you otherwise. So you do whatever it is that you do and we'll be supportive, but make sure you're safe. I'm going to help you with your visa stuff. So yeah, I moved to China, had a great time, crazy experience, ended up in a free apartment for a bunch of reasons, and then got kicked out of that apartment. And then I didn't have a place to live. So I just bounced around and lived in hostels and trains and spent all my time and money just vagabonding around China. I had a single backpack with everything I owned in it. And it was, it was awesome. I got old after a while. Like you can only go see so many Chinese cities before they all start to feel the same. And you're like, I, I get it. I can't really speak Chinese, but I understand what China's like. I mean, outside of like Beijing or Shanghai, it starts to feel the same. And the way that a lot of Ukrainian cities, like you get comfortable. And when I got comfortable, I knew that it was time to head back. So by that time I was like, okay, I've read my Thoreau. I've had my experience. It's time to like go join society and go back to college. So I went back, I did another semester and then I dropped out again. And that time I got in my car, my really cheap car. I drove to Silicon Valley. When I was in China is when I realized that I wanted to be uh, a tech entrepreneur. So because I was selling stuff on eBay and I buy stuff and import it and sell it, I was really interested in manufacturing and importing. So I spent a ton of time in China with importers and a ton of time in factories and learned that it just didn't excite me as much as I thought it would have. So when I decided I really didn't want to scale up what I was doing on eBay and become an importer, it was time for me to go back. So yeah, I went back to college and then ended up dropping out the next semester and moving to Silicon Valley and living in my car. Just before you moved to Silicon Valley, didn't you write this viral article in 2012, Successful Entrepreneurs Are Usually Liars, which is a very provocative titled article that if you don't read the content, you would think it suggested otherwise. And what was the story behind that and how did it impact you? Honestly, I'm having a hard time remembering. I'd spent a bunch of time with entrepreneurs, both in the US and in China. And I learned that the stories they told about their businesses were, were very sexy. They had painted a narrative that felt really good, but at the end of the day, a lot of what actually worked was just a lot of trial and error, a lot of work. And then after you're successful, you go backwards and paint the really pretty path that feels natural and like it was destined to be. And even in my story, right? Like the story that people tell is that Austin always wanted to be a tech entrepreneur, but he didn't have enough money. So he moved to Silicon Valley and he taught himself to code and that's the story. And as we already see, that's part of the story, but there is a decade of trial and error before that, before I figured out what that path was, my path of learning to code and getting a job was riddled with trial and error and failure and starting Lambda school is still some of the original assumptions we had didn't bear out and have to change this or twist that. 
it's really easy to kind of looking backwards, find the five points that make sense and you can paint a really pretty narrative there. So I also underestimated how much my words would be taken out of context because I didn't think anybody would ever care about a blog post. I wrote when I was that age and I deleted the blog like 10 years ago, but people still like, Hey, when you were 20, you wrote this. I'm like, did I? Then I have to go back and read it and put myself back in that mindset and remember what I was saying. But yeah, I mean, it was provocatively titled, but also nobody read it. Well, people read that one, but I was surprised that people cared about what I said. Vlogging was quite a big deal, right? When you were leaving in your car, you also blogged about that whole experience and that allowed you to connect with really important people in your life. Yeah. When I lived in my car, just talking about doing that, I've always kind of been public about what I've been doing more for me than for anybody else. Even the way I tweet today, it's not to, well, in some ways now it is like the marketing team at Lambda School saying, hey, you need to tweet about this. But it's always just been, this is what I'm working on. And I think it's interesting. And if you think it's interesting too, feel free to follow along. But it's for me to process my thoughts, for me to, you know, in many ways, some people have figured out that you can tell what I'm thinking about by reading my tweets and my blogs better than by having a meeting with me in some ways. I was discovering what it was like in America to carve a new path, but there are people that that really resonated with. So one particular person who is a, an entrepreneur in Utah that has now started a number of successful companies, now the, the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company called MX at the time it was Money Desktop. He reached out and said, and he had also dropped out of BYU. He'd also grown up in a Mormon family. So our paths aligned there and said, Hey, you know, I noticed that you're living in a car. I slept in a broom closet when I was getting my company started. Like, let's go to lunch sometime. And we can talk about this experience because I see a lot of you in myself and we should chat up, just get to know each other. But that wasn't the intention of writing the blog. It was somewhat, yeah, I mean. I'm still always surprised when people care about what I have to say, honestly, <laughs> but it was a little bit of, you know, this is, and when I was living in a car, I didn't have very many friends and it was like, this is the only way for me to connect with anybody that is not that one person that I know in Silicon Valley. And a, a little bit of like, if you want to try this, like this is how you can do it. That was a lot of the audience and in, in my opinion was. If you are somebody who feels like I do and you're in college or you're wondering what your options are, you're thinking of adopting an uber minimalist lifestyle. This is what it's like, and this is what's good about it. And this is what's bad about it. But yeah, that resonated with a few people that ended up being really impactful later on. Yeah. I mean, he ended up wanting to, and in fact, invested in your company as well. Yeah. Yeah, he did. 